It's our pleasure to introduce Michael Dreher from Aachen to the stage, who's got now a difficult task to tell us. We've got now negative studies, we've got positive studies, we've got neutral studies. So, where are we with the evidence, and to put us into the yeah right mood and for the discussion around clinical practice? Thanks for Nick and Patty sharing these important results with us. Um, I don't show you the negative results. I just want to show you the positive results and get an idea where we are. And Patty, if you can say me the pH of patient 64, you get another bottle of champagne, but we're going to do this later. 7.3. These are my disclosures. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to talk about home NIV for CBD patients with chronic respiratory failure to facilitate exercise capacity to promote pulmonary rehabilitation after acute respiratory failure and have a little look into the future and see where we are with the evidence within all these topics. And I think the biggest topic is non-invasive ventilation for chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure due to COPD. And we have heard a lot about the German multicenter study, about the study published by Thomas Kühnlein. And I think we also have heard a lot about sufficiently applying non-invasive ventilation. And by reducing CO2, we know that we do sufficiently apply non-invasive ventilation. So uh, the difference of the Thomas Kühnlein study to all the other studies was that it was it was concepted that NIV was targeted to reduce baseline PAC2 by at least 20%. And this is the major issue. And this was achieved with a mean inspiratory positive airway pressure of nearly 22 millibar and a breathing frequency of 16 breaths per minute. And by applying those pressures, here you can see PACO2 changes from baseline, which is the, the black curve over time, over the following 12 months. And you can clearly see that there is a much more reduction of, of PACU2 in the group receiving non-invasive ventilation. So where are we now with the evidence? We also had further studies um, from the past showing that you can reduce CO2 and it's a matter of the treatment strategy you apply. In that study, we compared high pressure ventilation versus low pressure ventilation. If you look at baseline values of the white columns, you see those patients were firstly randomized. It was a randomized crossover trial to high pressure ventilation. And you see there is a significant reduction of PCO2. And once they are switched to low pressure ventilation, you can see that PACO2 again increases. So by applying sufficient pressure levels, we can reduce CO2. We have an overall good compliance, and compliance was, I think, seven hours in the UK trial, which is really good. And high pressure ventilation in that trial, comparing high pressure ventilation versus low pressure ventilation, sorry, compliance in that trial, was 3.6 hours per night longer in the group receiving higher pressures compared to the group receiving low pressures. 3.6 hours per night. And this was, I think, due to the fact that only high pressure ventilation but not low pressure ventilation was associated with significant secondary outcome parameters, which is dyspnea during exertion, quality of life, and lung function parameters. So going back to the German multicenter study and looking at exercise capacity, and you can see that exercise capacity improves and remains stable over time in the group receiving non-invasive ventilation, but not in the control group. What about quality of life? And quality of life is really important in these patients because they are suffering from chronic respiratory failure. They have symptoms of nighttime hyperventilation. And higher values from baseline are associated with improvements in quality of life. And you can clearly see that non-invasive ventilation was associated with an increase of quality of life. And quality of life did not increase in the control group. And we have evidence from other studies. This is a German multicenter study, a prospective study, assessing quality of life in home mechanical ventilated patients. And here you can see in the COPD group, which is the black curves, that after one month of home mechanical ventilation, there is a significant improvement in quality of life, and this improvement remains stable over the following 12 months. And this is the main outcome parameter. This was the main outcome parameter, which was mortality rate. And you can see that the intervention group, the group receiving home mechanical ventilation, we are now again in the German multicenter study, had a significantly lower mortality rate compared to the control group, only receiving standard treatment and 
oxygen if indicated. So the German multi-center study was the first study showing that by applying sufficient pressure levels, by reducing elevated PCU2, you can have a significant impact on mortality in patients with chronic respiratory failure due to COPD. And this is also important. Um, we have international recommendations. This is some kind of a, of a discussion and CHESS published last year more than 20 hours of educational material when to start home mechanical ventilation in COPD and why and how to deal with those patients. So I think the studies from the past have changed a lot, have changed the way of thinking um, in the field non-invasive ventilation for stable hypercapnic COPD and here it was concluded that we should think about starting home mechanical ventilation once PACU2 is higher than 50 during daytime breathing or higher than 55 during nighttime spontaneous breathing in stable hypercapnic COPD. What about exercise capacity? We still have to ask the question or address the question, what is the evidence? And you can promote and you can facilitate exercise by using non-invasive ventilation. And I have shown three studies from our group, not to say that we have done quite well, but to criticize these studies, because we are talking about evidence. And if you look into a meta-analysis published two years ago, it is stated, and I think this is true, that a small number of available studies um, we are dealing with, a small sample size, a complete absence of power calculation, and that needs a more in-depth investigation in that field. What about pulmonary rehabilitation? And I think this is also really important. And this is work, I just show you one slide, work, work from the group of Peter Wextra, which has done, the group has done a lot of trials within the field, non-invasive ventilation in addition to pulmonary rehabilitation. And we can make a long story short because these patients were suffering from chronic respiratory failure due to COPD. They got pulmonary rehabilitation and they were randomized to receive rehab alone or rehab plus non-invasive ventilation. And the addition of nighttime non-invasive ventilation was associated with further increases in health-related quality of life. And you can see by applying a mean inspiratory positive airway pressure level of 20 millibar, you had a significant reduction of elevated PACU2 levels. After acute respiratory failure, home mechanical ventilation um, after acute respiratory failure has occurred, and I think we have heard this in the two talks before, we now have the evidence, we have some kind of evidence that we should use it in patients with acute on chronic respiratory failure, for example, and I don't have to comment on this brilliant results because you have seen them before. So where are we going into the future? And there are a lot of areas to investigate within the field non-invasive ventilation in COPD, and I just want to give you some kind of a subjective impression, what I think is quite important and what I think is interesting to go for. This is a study from our group, and I pointed this out before. We had a mean inspiratory positive airway pressure in the Köhnlein study of 22 millibar. In the um, Dutch study with rehab of 20 millibar, 24 millibar in the UK study, and this is data from our clinic, and we are using a mean inspiratory positive airway pressure of 23 millibar, and by using this pressure level, we significantly are reducing elevated PCU2 levels. So I think we are somewhere in between, let's say 20 to 25 millibar for COPD patients. But as long as you are decreasing CO2, you are doing good. And if you can decrease CO2 with 18 millibar, everything is fine. You don't need 30 millibar in every patient, not at all. We were asking ourselves, why do we have those impressive results in COPD? Those big signals on mortality rate, and is there anything else than giving a respiratory muscle rest. So we were looking on inflammatory markers over time, we were looking on cardiovascular biomarkers, and we have seen that there is some impact on inflammatory markers, but we don't have any idea where to go, honestly. We have seen a reduction of elevated pro BNP levels, and this is median value from 90 to 75. We have decreased it from a mean of 900 to 300, which is quite important. So we have to look further and think about if we are impacting, for example, 
example, on fluid level, or if we have any kind of direct effect with regard to the cardiovascular system, for example, if we are improving pulmonary hypertension. And the last point I wanted to make is, this is an interesting study, and we are talking about non-invasive ventilation in COPD patients, and we get a lot of information out of the devices if we use them. And this is work published last year in Sorex, and I think this is brilliant work. It's not the end of the story, but it is an idea we have to think further. The authors pointed out or asked the question, they wanted to assess whether daily variations in three parameters recorded by NIV software can predict an exacerbation. And they used respiratory rate, percentage of respiratory cycles triggered by the patient, and daily usage of NIV. They investigated 64 CBD patients and they found 21 exacerbations which were detected and medically confirmed. And what they have seen, here is the onset of exacerbation at point zero. What they have found is that prior an exacerbation, respiratory rate increases and prior an exacerbation, the respiratory cycles triggered by the patient also increases. And maybe we can use these data in order to predict an exacerbation and maybe to early treat an exacerbation and thereby prevent rehospitalization. And telemonitoring is a big story within the field of ventilator dependent patients, and there is a consensus statement of the European Respiratory Society recently published to get an idea where we are and where are we going. In order to have a, a good discussion at the end, I would like to, to conclude. Home mechanical ventilation for COPD patients, where are we now with the evidence? In the field with chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure, I think we have good evidence, and in my opinion, it's indicated. What about to facilitate exercise capacity? I think it's an option for some patients experienced with NIV. It cannot be generally recommended because there is no conclusive evidence. What about to promote or to facilitate pulmonary rehabilitation? I think we have good evidence for chronic hypercapnic COPD. Once you are using non-invasive ventilation in addition to pulmonary rehabilitation, you are gaining good results. We have talked about this before, and I think there are two differences, or there are some differences between the Dutch study from the group of Peter Wexler, which is really important because we have learned so many things out of the study and the UK study. And I think the most important point is if you look at CO2 values over time in the Dutch study, you see that CO2 is coming down in the control group and they have randomized two days after, um, after the index. And I think the fact that the UK study have randomized after a longer period showed us that, in my point of view, NIV after acute respiratory failure for home mechanical ventilation is indicated in acute on chronic respiratory failure. And here we are back within the story that we have good evidence for chronic respiratory failure. And I think in the future, we have to phenotype our COPD patients who benefits most from home mechanical ventilation and maybe we can use telemonitoring for detecting exacerbations, which is an important and um, quite um, good field to investigate. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward for the discussion.